Roy Buchanan could bend the truth as smoothly as he did the notes on his Telecaster. Roy was as great of a storyteller as he was a guitar player. He could take a simple guitar riff and phrase it 10 different ways to make you feel it every time. He could do the same thing when telling a story. I know there'll be some who has never heard of Roy Buchanan. And I get that. Roy was another one of those guitarists who played for himself. His attitude was, if you like it, great. If you don't, that's fine too. Or was it? But either way, he was going to play it his way, and he didn't care or really want to be famous. Just appreciate it. Listen to how he put it. I think probably the reason I never made it big was because I didn't care whether I made it big or not. I, like I said, I, I really didn't give a damn. All I wanted to do was learn to play the guitar for myself, and I, I didn't care about anybody else. I put a video out a few years back on guitarist Danny Gatton, and I compared him to the post-impressionist artist Vincent Van Gogh. Roy Buchanan could also fit in this comparison. One of the qualities all three of these fellows had in common was a heartfelt compassion to create. When a documentary was done on him and his career started to come to light, Roy seemed to get lost in the darkness he found there. Roy Buchanan was a pioneer in so many ways. If you're a guitar player or just someone who enjoys great, innovative guitar playing and its history, Keep watching this video. I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Leroy Buchanan was born September 23, 1939, in the town of Ozark, Arkansas. The family was soon moved west across country and settled in the town of Pixley, California, around 1942. Pixley is located about 50 miles to the north of Bakersfield. For any of you not familiar with the Bakersfield sound, it has a rich, musical history starting around 1950. A few names that'll come up in this video about Roy Buchanan will be Merle Haggard and Roy Nichols, both with strong ties to that Bakersfield sound. Roy started out playing on the lap steel guitar and he switched to six strings soon after that. He was said to have played in his first band at the age of 12. As he moved on into his teens, he became interested in the R&B music he heard on the radio. It was around this time he formed a band that started playing around town in some of the honky-tonks. By now, Roy, who was 16, wanted more for music and headed down to Los Angeles and met a half-assed agent named Bill Orwig, and he would help Roy get into a band called the Heartbeats. In this band was a drummer named Spencer Dryden, who would later go on to play with the Jefferson Airplane. The only thing that really happened for this band was they got into one of the teen movies called Rock Pretty Baby. This was around 1956. Orwig screwed him around and the band fell apart and Roy found himself stuck in Oklahoma City. So he just decided to hang around Oklahoma City instead of heading back west and ended up picking up a gig playing on a local TV show called the Oklahoma Bandstand. This is where he would meet and play for a time with Dale Hawkins and record the old Willie Dixon number with him called My Babe. This was sometime in 1958. A side note here on Dale Hawkins. About a year earlier, in 1957, Dale had wrote and recorded a song called Suzy Q using a 15-year-old guitarist from Shreveport, Louisiana named James Burton on the recording. This song, Suzy Q, would be the same one that John Fogarty of Creedence Clearwater Revival would put on their debut album in 1968. This was Creedence Clearwater's only top 40 hit not written by John Fogarty, and it peaked at number 11 in November of 1968. In October of 1960, Dale Hawkins and Buchanan were playing a club in Washington, D.C. when a young girl named Judy Owens introduced herself to Roy. A year later, they were married. Roy and Judy would go on to have seven children. But before settling down, Roy went with Dale Hawkins on a trip to Canada in January of 1961. They played Toronto, where Dale's cousin, Ronnie Hawkins, who had made a good name for himself and his band in the area, ended up luring Roy away from Dale, mostly to help tutor the band's talented but still young and raw guitarist, Robbie Robertson. As Roy explained once, 
Ronnie Hawkins was very strict about how he was backed, and Robbie would either overplay or underplay. He'd be playing lead when Ronnie was singing, and it just wouldn't work out. So I showed him how to do it, because that's what I was really into, backing up people and making them sound good. After Roy left, a bass player named Rick Danko started with the group, and along with guitarist Robbie Robertson and drummer LeVon Helms, they would end up leaving Ronnie Hawkins and forming their own group, naming it simply The Band. Once back, Roy started playing club gigs in and around the D.C. area. Les Paul had heard about Roy and came to a place in Philadelphia to hear him. Afterward, Les had this to say about Roy's playing. We had never heard anything quite like what Roy was doing. He interested the hell out of me. He's not playing an arpeggio the way you learn to play an arpeggio. If you had studied the instrument, you played it right straight on, the chromatic scale you're taught. This guy was anything but conventional. He was just out there. He was unrestricted as far as what he played. If he felt like getting from here to there, it didn't matter how he got there. If he didn't pick it, he plucked it with his other fingers. There were no rules with Roy. He was cruising down his own lane. Les seemed to have summed up Roy's playing pretty good right there. To me, Roy was one of them guitar players who you didn't hear his greatness from a record. It was his live performances where he came on and you got caught up in what he was doing. As I said, Danny Gatton, he painted pictures with his music. Roy did the same, but to get the full effect of his talent, you had to watch and hear him do it. Roy did things on a guitar that was just amazing. He could use his volume and tone knob to sound like anything from a steel guitar to a wah-wah pedal. He would play along slow and easy up high on the neck with beautiful melodic notes, then burst into a lightning flurry of notes and in the blink of an eye, end up back down by the headstock playing something slow and melodic in that register. Roy said he picked up some of his country music style from Roy Nichols, who was Merle Haggard's guitar player. There's a video out there on YouTube of the time they jammed together. I'll link it in the description box. I heard after this jam, Roy Nichols asked Roy Buchanan how he made them bird sounds. Now Nichols was talking about Buchanan's pinched harmonic notes. Merle Haggard went on to say, I think he's got a lot of heart and that's something you can't fake, you know? If you have it, you've got it. If you don't have it, there's no way to make it look like you do. Jerry Garcia said, probably the most original country style rock and roll guitar player. You know, like a Fender guitar player has the nicest tone and the most amazing chops, technically super fast and much neglected. It's been said that he jammed with Jimi Hendrix and there's a video out there and people are claiming that it's him jamming with Jimi. But I don't buy it. One reason, Roy never mentioned it. And two, if you study the video close, it doesn't look that much like Roy, especially the nose. That nose belongs to a New York session guitarist named Hugh McCracken. The video is on YouTube and I'll link it in the description below this video. You can look, listen, and give your thoughts on it in the comments section. But for me, I'll believe the story that Roy did go and see Jimmy play and was impressed with his playing and style. But as far as them ever jamming together, nothing I've seen or read makes me believe it ever happened. One thing I will say about Roy is he plays a live version of Hey Joe, and he's the only one I ever thought came close to nailing it like Jimmy did. Roy's is one of the best versions ever, in my opinion. March of 1975, Jeff Beck released his Blow by Blow album, featuring the song, Cause We've Ended as Lovers, which was dedicated to Roy Buchanan. So in 1976, Roy put out a Street Called Straight album on Atlantic Records. The album contains the instrumental, My Friend Jeff, in honor of Jeff Beck. Roy had many players who looked up to his innovative playing, but to be honest here, Roy could also rub them the wrong way too. The story of Roy being asked to join the Rolling Stones in 1969 and then turning them down could possibly have been one of Roy's tales, and it just might have rubbed Keith Richards the wrong way. As Roy told the story, yes, that came about through my first manager. 
I had never actually met the Rolling Stones, but they had heard of me some way or another. They mentioned to my manager that they wanted me to tour with them. The main reason I decided not to go, besides the fact that I don't want to travel, was that I didn't know the material and I didn't figure I could do the job right. To sit down and learn all those songs, that would have taken a lot of work. I guess I'm lazy. Now in an interview, Keith Richards once told this story about Roy. Roy Buchanan? It's very funny. Eric Clapton, Ronnie Wood, and I pissed in his beer once, he said with a big laugh. It's the only time we ever got that mean with anybody. It was an Atlantic recording session in the 70s. I said, go ahead, Eric, get your cock out. We'll be pissing in that sucker's beer. He's being too pushy. Eric will deny it, of course, but don't worry about that. I've got Ronnie Wood to back me up. Now, did any, all or part of this story ever happen? Is it really true? I don't know. But one thing I do know is musicians and how they can be at times. And trust me, if I had been Roy Buchanan, I wouldn't have left my beer unattended around those guys, especially if they were drinking. And even if they didn't have something against me, drunk musicians can have a very warped sense of humor. Trust me on this. Now the story he told how he came to be the owner of his famed Telecaster named Nancy is another good one. It seems while working a day job as a barber, Roy said he saw someone walk past the shop window carrying a battered old Telecaster under his arm and said, I knew that guitar was mine, you know. So I walked out right in the middle of a haircut and I said, where'd you get that guitar? I just told him, I want it. I said, I'll get you the most beautiful guitar you've ever seen and I'll trade you straight across. I left work that day and went to a friend of mine with connections and said, I want a purple Telecaster. He had it before the sun went down. We swapped guitars, man. That was it. It was like he knew it was my guitar too. How did the Telecaster get named Nancy? Man, there's quite a few stories on that. One was, Roy was briefly having an affair with a gal named Nancy Davis before she married a guy named Ronnie and changing her last name to Reagan. One that does make a little sense, Roy once stated in a guitar player interview that the name was on a piece of masking tape in the pickup cavity. Now in the 1950s, women did a lot of work on Fender guitars and they did the wiring and soldering. When they were finished, they wrote on a piece of masking tape, their name and date, they did the work. Maybe a Nancy did the wiring on Roy's telly, so he named it that. Roy's also said he never named a guitar in his life, so who knows? Nancy is a 53 Telecaster with a nail hole in the peg head. It was said he drilled that hole in there so he could hang it on a nail in his basement. Roy owned quite a few guitars besides Nancy, including two other early 50s Telecasters, two Les Pauls, a 72 Custom Tele, and an 83 Tele, a natural with a rosewood neck, and a Guild T200, and this Tele clone with a pointed headstock. I've seen many different auctions and stories on when, where, and what was sold. Japanese collector Mac Yasuda bought and owns Nancy, last I saw and she'll show up at a different museum or guitar show. I've also heard Mac bought Roy's whole collection. Like all stories about Roy, there are a lot of loose ends when it comes to his guitars. If anyone out there has some information on some or all of these guitars, please feel free to put it in the comments section. In 1970, John Adams, a producer for WNET Television in Washington, D.C., made the documentary The Best Unknown Guitarist in the World about Roy. Airing in November 1971, it led him to signing with Polydor label. In 1972, Roy recorded two albums for Polydor, Roy Buchanan and Second Album. Both were critical, if not financial successes. Through the 1970s, he recorded three more albums for Polydor and then three for Atlantic Records. From 1978 to 1985, he didn't record any albums. But then he signed with Alligator Records, a Chicago, Illinois-based blues label, and in 1985 released When a Guitar Plays the Blues, 
It was to be his biggest success. It stayed on Billboard charts for 15 weeks, earning him a Grammy nomination for Blues Album of the Year. He recorded two more albums with Alligator, Dancing on the Edge in 1986, which won the College Media Journal Award for Best Blues Album of the Year, and Hot Wires in 1988. During an interview in the documentary, Roy admits to having an inner lonely feeling about him, the inability to really relate much to other people. He tells how he started using drugs and overdosed and ended up in the hospital sometime in the mid to late 60s. He realized the lifestyle wasn't working for him. At some point, he developed a drinking problem that was to haunt him the rest of his life. He quit music for a short time, but he missed playing it and got right back into it. Roy's alcohol abuse became a persistent problem. Although friends, family, and bandmates has said Roy had laid off the drinking and seemed happy. On August 14, 1988, his wife had called the police to their Reston, Virginia home about a domestic disturbance. Roy was then arrested for being drunk and disorderly. He died that night in his jail cell, the cause officially recorded as suicide by hanging. Some still dispute this finding. All I gotta say on the subject isn't even my own words, and it's a quote. People don't fake depression, they fake being okay. Remember that, be kind. I was fortunate enough to see Roy Buchanan perform live sometime around 1985, I think. He totally captivated me with his playing. I really think the guy was a genius. He did things with a guitar that I'm still in awe of even today. He would play so heart achingly beautiful, then play something that I can only describe as I'm a tortured man. The looks on his face and the sounds of his guitar are still etched in my mind almost 40 years later. The strange thing about it all was I didn't really know much about Roy's music before going to see him. I had just heard of him. But after watching his performance, I knew I had just seen and heard the best unknown guitar player in the world, as he's called by so many. He was an artist with that guitar. For some of you who aren't familiar with Roy's playing, I'm going to leave some links in the description section of this video. Also, there are a few good books with a lot more great Roy stories and information, and I'll link them up too. If you enjoyed this video, check out this one on Danny Gatton. I'll bet you'll like it also. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, I'd appreciate it if you do before you leave. Also, smash that like button and share this video around so we can turn Roy Buchanan on to other folks. I gotta run. Take care, y'all, and thanks for watching and supporting the channel. I do appreciate it.